but also gracing our Deccan Birders annual dinner function for which uh, <coughs> I fought tooth and nail to bring uh, Kalyan as our chief guest. I remember <coughs> I decided that uh, we will call Kalyan as our chief guest and then uh, Kalyan had gone off for his shoot. He confirmed yes, I will come and then he gone off for a shoot all over the country. So, he has this reply, auto reply mail, you know. So, when I say, where are you? He is confirmed, okay, 28th September. So, I say, oh, where are you? And then in the auto will shoot off that I'm busy till tuck, 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 this date. So, can't talk. And I immediately, Ashish, Kalyani is not to be found. What about my 28th? Ah, she said, relax. He said, he'll come, he'll come. So, there's a long gap and then Kalyan was in somewhere out in the wilderness. As soon as he came back to civilization, when he sent an uh, email to Ashish, then I just relaxed and I was totally looking forward to this wonderful function that you're going to have with Kalyan as our uh, chief guest. And uh, <coughs> I request now our... Uh, Vice President Bhardavaj Korni to give us the welcome address. If you ask him, he will say he came back from civilization into winter. <laughs> <laughs> I should read him that. Okay, uh, good evening to everybody. Welcome to this lovely evening. Um, all of you know that Bird Watcher Society now, Deccan Birders, started in 1980. So, next year we'll be completing 40 years of our existence, and it's been a wonderful uh, uh, journey all along. Bez you know, when we started, I think I joined sometime in 1988, but when we started in 1980, it was a motley grou group of less than 10 people who were very enthusiastic and um, looked around places in and around Hyderabad. Uh, in the last 40 years or so, we have now morphed into a fairly large group of more than 450 people. Um, all of you are aware of what are the kind of activities that we do. Um, ma mainly, we look at having field trips every month. We have indoor meetings. We do uh, Asian waterfowl census. And uh, we interact with the, the um, forest department by sharing with them the kind of birds that we watch and the lists that we do. Uh, the objectives of the society, right from the time when it was Bird Watchers Society of Andhra Pradesh to now it is Deccan Birders, the obvious reason being the state split. And uh, whenever we went to meet the department, they used to ask us why it is still Andhra Pradesh and not Telangana. So, we had a lot of debate and we thought the best is to be staying neutral, not get into this kind of a politicization. So, we felt Deccan Birders was a better name encompassing a larger region, but the objects of the society remain the same, spreading the message of bird conservation. And uh, just I thought this is a time when we meet annually to reiterate a couple of the objects of the society, which is basically to inculcate a spirit of adventure, to impress upon people the role of avifauna, to inculcate a sense of responsibility towards maintaining the environment, to work for the protection and conservation of bird sanctuaries, especially in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, and basically to promote the knowledge of ornithology. Um, typically, members meet once a month during the field outings and also during the indoor meetings where some presentations and film shows are shown. Um, in the last couple of years, we have looked at trying to increase this, but about a decade ago, the society thought that we should have one day of the year where members meet one evening along with their families and friends to listen to eminent speakers. And uh, it's almost a decade now sir, that we have been having this event regu regularly. So today we have Kalyan here. We thank him for accepting our invitation and being here. I am sure all of you are looking forward to it. Um, our president, Mr. JVD Murthy, unfortunately had to uh, go out of the country and so he is not here. He conveys his best wishes for the evening. And on behalf of the entire executive committee, I thank Kalyan for being here and all of you for being here 
on this evening. I am sure you are looking forward to a fantastic talk. Thank you and over to Kalyan. Thank you. I can speak without going here. I can speak. Now I'm sure you all are waiting to hear Kalyan more than you are waiting to hear me. I understand, but then I have to introduce Kalyan and his and underline his achievements. Kalyan is a wildlife photographer, filmmaker, conservationist, naturalist and explorer. Besides all this, I found although there is so much on his plate and he is so renowned, Kalyan is basically a very simple guy. I think uh, simple and then high achieving it shows. And uh, he has worked on many landmark blue chip wildlife series for the BBC and National Geographic Channel. His work has appeared in many publications worldwide including National Geographic, Nature, Guardian, BBC Wildlife, Geo, Smithsonian and Lonely Planet. He is the founder of India Nature Watch, co-founder of Nature in Focus and in the last few years he has been working on various documentaries for many international productions. He freelances with the BBC Natural History Unit and National Geographic Channel. Um, there are many many feathers in his cap. To recount a few, um, he is the Sanctuary Asia Wildlife Photographer of the Year 2015 and BBC Wildlife <coughs> Photographer of the Year 2013. Carl Zeiss Wildlife Conservation Award 2017 and there are more guys. He um, amongst the scores of films documentaries that he has made his recent film Wild Karnataka has won much acclaim. His uh, film on the swamp tigers of Sundarbans on which he spent um, brace yourself 600 hours and uh, almost 24 hours of the day he was in uh, Sundarbans and the mangrove and he lived in the boat so it's not even 12 hours it's 24 hours so uh, that's how and he's uh, lucky enough to I think the most luckiest thing to see uh, the tiger Sundarbans tiger walk one kilometer along the shore so imagine the kind of footage you get when it walks one kilometer along the shore and uh, it, it, it appeared only once. So we are all looking forward to see that and uh, this uh, Swamp Tigers of Sundarbans has been nominated for this year's Emmy Awards. A big round of applause. So after recounting all this, we are again, uh, I am uh, telling every one of you, all the members, non-members, everybody that uh, we are so happy to have Kalyan on this day and uh, the floor is all Kalyan's and we are all eager to see what is in store for us. I am sure it will be a most enjoyable and learning experience for all of us. Kalyan, please. Thank you for the very generous introduction and it's my pleasure to be here. I'm originally from Andhra Pradesh but settled now in uh, Bangalore. Um, but uh, um, 
it's I know a lot of friends here. It's great to be back here, and especially on your annual day, so it's uh, quite a privilege for me. Um, so today I wanted to talk about what I do. I mean, uh, in some sense, I, at the end of the day, I'm a storyteller. You know, the medium can be different. I write, I photograph, I make more and more the wildlife films. But along the journey, you know, you discover a lot, lot of very interesting things. And I want to talk about two of these journeys specifically today that I've gone through. Uh, it's not the films itself, uh, but in the process of making the film, you come across uh, some interesting things in the field. Um, but I want to come back to story because uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, some of your photographers here and, and things like that, right? What connects us to a visual image is, is um, it's not the shutter speed or the ISO or the perfect, you know, uh, sharp lens. It's the emotional uh, content of that photograph itself. So, in the work I do, um, I'm sure a lot of you know this, you know, our human brain has two distinct parts, you know, the left side, right side. Left side is responsible for all the memory, reasoning and things like that, whereas the right side is responsible for all your emotions primarily. And me as a storyteller, I, when somebody looks at my photo or something and says, you know, oh, what an amazing picture, you know, that you use an amazing lens, I think I failed. And I want somebody to look at the picture and say, you know, it made me cry, it made me laugh. You know, I think I want that emotional connect. And stories is really the best way to connect people to environment, especially. And I think we're living in an age, I think all of you have been following the climate change protest that's been happening in the last one week or so. And the way we can make people care for environment is, is making them care. So how do you tell these stories? Again, how do you make people care? So it comes a lot down to aesthetics and storytelling. Um, I'll give an example. Uh, there's a photo of a, I mean, I'm sure all of you know about the vulture, vulture decline. Can all of you hear me without this? Yeah. Yes. All of you know about the vulture decline that's happened in India, right? And how do you communicate this positive or negative stories using a single image? So this is an image I took long time ago, um, you know, and, and you know, in a photograph, just to get to slightly technical, you can crop an image. That is, you cut the image to suit your story in some sense. So I can, you know, cut the image in a way where it's on the right of the frame or in a way where it's on the left of the frame. It's the same image really, you know, it's just there's more space yeah, on either side. The reason I'm saying this is because, you know, when the vulture decline started, I took this for a long time ago, like I said. When the vulture decline started, um, some of the wildlife magazines, uh, they wanted to communicate this, that vultures were on the decline, on the way out as a, as a species. Which image do you think conveys that? This or this? Yeah. This one, right? So clearly because it's on, a, on the frame, it's on its way out, right? It's, fly, it's about to fly out of the frame, but as a species also it's about to uh, go extinct. So it's very interesting because the magazine carried uh, an article, I mean there's not the original layout, but a layout like this where the vulture is on the, it's about to go out of the frame, vulture is on the edge. But the reason I find this fascinating is because the same magazine, it's actually Sanctuary Asia, a couple of years later uh, was doing a positive story about because since then we've had a ban on diclofenac, you know, the drug that was responsible, but we also have uh, captive breeding uh, programs now. So the same magazine took the same image, but they used a different composition of it. <laughs> You know, so it's 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 a very positive composition here, where where the vultures are actually coming back. You know, and and the title of the thing was written of the vultures. So even, I mean, as 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 a photographer, you know, it's that you need to think about what the image is trying to communicate. And sometimes it's important to zoom out as well. You know, when when you guys travel around, I'm sure you see uh, that's a dead uh, southern bird wing, one of the largest butterflies of India. But just by zooming out, you can tell the context of. Uh, what's happening. For me, this is a case of a, it's a, just a dead butterfly, but this one communicates that uh, how the butterfly died because of uh, roads and the traffic and things like that. So with that context, I want to talk about two stories that I've done. Okay. Uh, the first one is slightly sad. So bear with me. I will end my talk with positive, but, but, you know, I think all of us need to understand this. Uh, this is the story about this girl. Her name is Suprita. Um, she lives in a rural Karnataka close to Hassan and um, 
you know in india rural rural india they don't send girl child to higher education you know uh, it's, it's only the boys who get the privilege but whereas how parents were very open and she was one of the bright students in school and uh, were really supportive of she was one of the two girls in that whole village who would still go to school and and in 2014 she was going to uh, her 10th standard board exam and uh, she was going with her classmate and on the way an elephant came and killed her okay she died uh, right away um it broke the family because not just the family the whole village because you know she was one of the brightest child and, and for somebody unfortunate to go that way okay um what this led to and, and and this is a place where they had a lot of human elephant conflict uh before many people have died before but you know when this young girl died it really got you know got made people angry so they protested on the streets they blocked the highway and the forest i mean they they really insisted that forest department had to do something and in 2014 unfortunately i mean forest department unfortunately was was uh, was under pressure to do something about it so the high court uh, karnataka high court got involved and they came up with this very historic decision where they said that this taluk in 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 hasan district should not have elephants okay it was a high court judgment that the uh, um, forest department had to follow but you know it's very easy to say catch all the elephants in this area you know it was just literally three lines in a in a uh, scientific document but do have any of you do, do you any of you know what it takes to capture an elephant so it's a short film uh, it's it's 4 minutes long just to show you what it what happens when you capture an elephant or rather how do you capture an elephant
sorry i know that's a bit hard to watch but it's important that you watch it and i'll tell you why um this is a positive elephant story by the way i know it's sad but uh but this so what do you do when you catch these elephants and and you know with forest department has tried before is trying to put them in a forest somewhere else but these elephants always come back you know because they have homing instinct and although they were released within few weeks they would be back where they were caught so for the the forest department was uh, they had no option but to take them into captivity and um, this one and, and you you saw that elephant that was captured in the night in the loaded in the truck uh, that's the same elephant that killed this girl suprita okay it's very unfortunate because her de- that incident that day on uh, in february of 2014 broke the family but also broke the elephant family um and to tame an elephant you know you really have to starve them you know keep training them and where do these elephants eventually end up you know you go to these elephant joy rides and parks and more and more in south india they're being used in festivals and things like that okay so what i at least request you is next time you go on an elephant ride whatever remember that they come from a very dark past and we are fueling the demand where we were forced to catch more elephants from from the wild but i'll tell you why this is a positive story you know it's you know the reason i'm t- telling you the story of suprita is because her parents you know obviously clearly uh, upset with her daughter's death the father especially is a great believer in elephants you know he loves elephants and even after this elephant killed his daughter uh, he he's he's not ang- angry at the elephants itself and for the last 3 years something interesting has been happening that elephant i showed you which was caught in the wild he's been trained now he's been called shrikanta it's one of the elephant camps in karnataka and since the last 3 years they it's one of the elephant that they get to the dashara festival which is actually happening next week and the beautiful part of the story is that the parents of suprita every year in the last 3 years been going to dashara festival and taking blessings from the very individual elephant that killed their daughter for me i think this gives me hope because i think if if a father is able to for, forgive the creature that killed his daughter i think that's what really gives me hope in india being able to people ac- accommodating wildlife even when it affects them deeply yeah so that's one story i want to talk about this is uh, another interesting journey i went and and uh, the reason i'm talking about this is because all of you must know about the great indian bustard right Uh, GIB is probably one of the most endangered um, um, bird in our country. I don't know how many of you know. In the 70s, it was supposed was considered as the national bird of India instead of peacock. But I think it was Salim Ali um, who said, the, uh, Salim Ali, somebody else who said, if somebody misspelled the word, it wouldn't look very nice. <laughs> um, so I'll tell you. So this is something a project again I did a couple of years ago, which is I try to understand migrations, migrations of both wildlife and people. and i've gone through three phases in this first of all um, many of you know about the wildebeest migration that happens in africa um you have millions of wildebeest that cross from tanzania to kenya and they come back how does that happen how does that happen and and the way i understood that was spending some time with the local masai tribes who who also follow with lakhs and lakhs of cattle along with them the reason the millions of that small i mean it's relatively big compared to indian parks but the place is able to retain so much wildebeest is because they're on the move all the time if they were in one place they would overgraze the area eat up the grass and there wouldn't be enough grass to have such large numbers the reason you have millions of wildebeest is because they're migrating all the time they're never in one place and that's a very important thing about animal migration and and this is not induced by humans but it it's something that animals do themselves and they've realized especially in africa that by keeping on the move they can as a species can have lot more numbers and sustain more numbers uh this came to my s- second realization when i spent uh, two months with him his name is mahendra he's from a dangar community you know the shepherding community that you have in in deccan basically you know the northern karnataka maharashtra and parts of telangana and, and ap as well and these guys essentially are shepherds you know they have lots of actually thousands of sheep each family carries thousands of sheep and they migrate every monsoon they start all the way from mumbai they cut across maharashtra come to andhra pradesh graze for a few months and they go back it's about a 400 km journey that they make with uh, so many sheep 
uh, they create one of uh, today I know a lot of people were talking about uh, traffic jam traffic in Hyderabad and I'm from Bangalore so you can know how bad it is but uh, these dangas create the biggest traffic jam in India when they have to uh, um, cross 10,000 sheep across the Pune Mumbai highway sometimes the ja traffic jam is about three hours long but what's interesting about this is the landscape that they live in um, they need the same kind of uh, I mean so they need basically grass fresh grass and historically this is all wasteland which people could walk around but more and more in India uh, that land is disappearing it's either taken up by SEZ or an industrial area because in India officially the government of India classifies a landscape like this as wasteland because there are no trees growing there okay um, so they migrate about uh, these what I call village commons you know um, villages have uh, revenue land which is f specifically meant for grazing so anyway the reason I'm, I'm showing this is because I met Mahindra he said oh do you know wolves follow me wherever I go I was very fascinated what do you mean wolves follow you he said yeah I have my own pack of wolves that follow me wherever I go and I said no that can't be true he said if you don't trust me you come come with me and stay with me for a month so I trusted him and I went with a special camera uh, it's called a thermal camera where in pitch darkness you can see you know because it picks up the heat um, signature of these animals so it's a short um, sequence I had done for uh, a film for BBC I'll just pay, play you that clip okay <laughs> So, um, what is interesting, fascinating is that uh, in these landscapes, the wolves actually migrate, the dangas are migrating with their sheep, the wolves are actually migrating with, with the dangas. But, um, like, uh, like what I've learned in, uh, in Maasai, with the Maasai community there and, and with this community as well is their extreme uh, amazing knowledge about natural history. Okay. So, even with uh, the shepherds, you know, I, they had a very interesting algorithm. In fact, I have seen because I was migrating with them what was interesting was the birds in that landscape were migrating with the sheep because wherever the sheep and goats are going they're disturbing the understory which is disturbs all the insects which it, it, uh, attracts the birds so it was very interesting because it was this dangas going sheep going and all the birds following them um, and, and they really uh, care for the animal but you know they have a, what they call a very interesting algorithm you know um, and, and I kind of try to decode uh, what, what they do. So one of the things they do is they never go to the same place in the same season again. They go to a place and they keep moving and, and they have this kind of zigzag route which they never come back to the same place. Uh, and they spend more time if the grass is good, okay, but not too long where the, the sheep will overgraze um, the grass. And they like to keep on the move. You know, they, their thing is that if you stop anywhere, uh, their own their sheep will destroy the local grasses and the local ecosystems so all the, i mean having good grasslands is as important for the shepherds as it is for uh, wildlife lovers like us and and the amount of, like i said the th amount of time they spend is more important uh, than the numbers that they have um, so for them there's more grass there's more sheep and they really feel that fire has a very important ecosystem to play uh, in, in these grasslands because uh, in fact they sometimes put uh, the fire themselves because if the grass is completely dried up and you know this when, when there's a fire in the grasslands fresh roots ca come out within few days you know so it's fresh fodder for um, um, the, the sheep and they also you know uh, enhancing the landscape by grazing, defecating, stomping and salivating into this ground so essentially putting nutrients back in these grasslands and they feel that the you know the predator prey relationship started because of these migrations and i'll tell you why they feel that i mean this is during evolutionary process okay it's these wolves that keep wild animals on that so actually when they're migrating they even have black bucks and chinkaras joining them at various parts and and their observation is that if if the wolves weren't there predators weren't there in grassland ecosystem the animals would be in the same place and overgraze the area. It's because of these predators like wolves, they are keeping the animal on the move all the time, which is keeping the health of the grasslands intact. It's quite fascinating to learn that and you can see the similar patterns from around the world. Uh, 
and and I want to <laughs> come back to come to busters. You know, where does the busters fit in into all this? Um, as you know, we have probably less than 150 left um, in in our country. It's quite a spectacular bird. If if you haven't seen it, please see it because we might not have this uh, bird for a long time. Um, so. Again, I'm not a scientist, okay, and, and I could be factually wrong here, but I'm, what I'm sharing is purely um, information that I'm able to put together by meeting and talking to a lot of these people. Um, do you know how many uh, Great Indian Bustard sanctuaries are there in, in India right now? Any guesses? Sorry? Nine, actually, yeah. So there are totally nine great sanctuaries dedicated for Great Indian Bustards. Do you know how many of them have bustards? Yes, only one. The, the desert national park is the only one where it's there. In Andhra, in Andhra Pradesh, from Rolapadu, they've disappeared. Karnataka, they've disappeared. Nanaj, a very famous place in Maharashtra, where they've disappeared. Desert national park. That's in Rajasthan. Yes. Hmm. So, it's very interesting, right? Uh, I mean, the government of India has actually put these, declared these national parks specifically to save an animal, uh, a bird in this case, fenced it, keeping all the intrusions out and things like that, but yet the bird has disappeared. And we, at least we don't know yet, it's, it's not like vultures where a drug is killing them off or something like that. It could be, but from my understanding so far is that uh, they're just disappearing. And this is where I think we need to look at this historical context of how this grassland ecosystems and, and great Indian busters fit in. And this is uh, more and more studies from actually wildlife biologists is showing this. This is what is done when the minute you declare a sanctuary, you fence it and the primary thing that uh, the forest department does is to keep uh, grazers out, you know, you have cattle or sheep are coming in which might destroy the grassland. So traditionally, most of the landscape looked like this. It's what, we, what I was saying as village commons. And people and wildlife have been living in a lo lot of these grassland areas. If you go to places like uh, places in Rajasthan and Gujarat where you see amazing wild birds living with vill in villages with people uh, and things like that. But, like I said, because this landscape is classified as uh, wasteland, they fence the small area and the rest of the area is let out for development. Okay. Um, unfortunately, some of these areas uh, come in um, not in the wildlife division but in the territorial division uh, uh, where a lot of these landscapes, which is actually beautiful habitat for GIBs and wolves, is used for uh, planting. Uh, I mean, I, all of us agree planting is good, but you know, certain habitats need to be left intact. They're meant to be grasslands, and this is the landscapes we're converting. And even worse, in a state like Gujarat now, um, a lot of these landscapes have actually been given out for green energy. Okay, so um, you know, like I said, India has about 150 odd busters left. And do you know that there are busters in uh, in uh, well, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh now, <laughs> and, uh, and in Karnataka. There are about eight bustards in, in South India right now. Nana, all of them are in a farmer's cotton fields, not in a protected area national park. Okay, so we really have to relook at how we manage these grasslands. And, and the reason I'm so so if you, so if you think about it, why is it that these bustards are not in the protected, beautiful natural grasslands, but they are actually pretty much out of 150 bustards, more than one, 120 bustards are actually outside protected areas in somebody's farm somewhere. Why is it happening? And and you know, and when when we looked at uh, some of the data in Africa, actually we don't have much studies about GIBs in India, but in Africa, I mean you don't you get the Kori bustard, it's a different species. They found that when you fence an area and keep all the cattle out, the grass grows too much, too high, and the busters can't display to each other. You know, because during the breeding time they need to display to each other. So they figured out that it's not a great Indian buster, but the Kori buster in, in Africa. They figured out that having little bit, not overgrazing, I do agree that sometimes that people tend to overgraze, but a little bit of that Maasai cattle coming in and grazing on the little bit of grass, that the busters, they really love that place. So maybe is that what, I don't know, I, there's no science behind it, there's no science behind from what I'm saying, but is this what we are missing out in India to save the rarest bird in India? Maybe we actually have to rethink about how we protect land, you know. Uh, 
maybe a little bit of the grazing and, and, and literature and examples show that little bit of uh, not over grazing but little bit of grazing is actually good for the species these animals prefer that even wolves in india for example uh, yv jala he's a uh, famous scientist from wildlife institute he's, he did his phd on wolves and he found that 98 percent of wolves diet in india is sheep and goat very little life prey okay in fact the reason we have wolves is because they actually feed on this cattle and most and again 90 plus population of wolves are outside protected areas these are in in the outside villages in various areas so uh, maybe uh, like i said i think i really want you guys to think about and, and i know we have presence from forest department also is how we relook at protecting this landscape and i'm not saying that you know let cattle into tiger reserves and all that i'm just saying specifically grassland ecosystems dry grasslands ecosystems can use a little bit of grazing and and we as bird watchers or people who care for environment have really have to relook at how we draw those boundaries but also this is about justice to people as well you know so one of the things i learned with mahendra was that he's not a fan of forest department because one is of course uh, uh, you know a lot of those land went off for industrial areas and then some grasslands were there and conservationists like us went and said you know this has to be protected so they put a big fence around it where he can't take his cattle now okay and uh, i i walked with him five years ago and i spoke to him last year and he was saying that there's so many barriers now that he might not be able to migrate anymore his children won't migrate anymore and then what happens to all these wolves in this landscape which completely depend on these livestock and and the migrations okay and you know busters are also a species which migrate in short distances so uh, but with all that sad news but i just want to show this picture which came uh, last evening rajasthan has managed to first uh, the first captive breeding of uh, great indian bustard uh, so first chick was born actually um, just from yesterday so we are probably in a path of recovery and when we put these birds back in the wild i think we really have to see how how we do it so um yeah so that's what my talk was about and i really wanted you to th rethink about what ecosystems are and pristine pristine versus um, other ecosystems so i want to end my talk with maybe not a conservation film i mean i've been doing a lot of conservation film but i also realize and there are a lot of children young people in this auditorium you can't talk about environment and conservation without first getting fascinated by wildlife you know all of us might participate in a climate protest tomorrow is because we are all converts here we all you are in this room because you like wildlife you like b watching birds so i really felt that before i tell somebody especially my let's say my parents or my mother was not at all into wildlife you know if i ask her and say can you save the great indian bustard she's like what please <laughs> okay so i realized that i need to get them fascinated about this wildlife before they even talk about conservation okay so in the last couple of years i've gone back to doing from this this conservation stories to doing those pretty stories where you make people fall in love with wildlife so one of the projects that me and my colleagues did in the last couple of years was working closely with karnataka forest department and uh, some of you many of you have seen it uh, it's called wild karnataka i just want to play the trailer of it and uh, just to celebrate i really think we need to celebrate the wildlife we have and although we've talked about depressing stories about great indian busters disappearing and things like that and i don't know who my, the conversation i was having with, with this morning or somebody india as a country you know with 350 plus people per square kilometer with so much poverty with aspiration of an 8 plus percent gdp we still able to conserve so much wildlife no other country if, if you see in that lens no other country has managed to do that and one of the reason i want to talk about that talk about spoke about that elephant thing is also because in people people in india forgive wildlife you know if you look at any western country yeah, in fact there was a news last week there's a puma that came it didn't even attack a person it came near a school in arizona immediately the wildlife department went out in a helicopter and shot the puma the puma hasn't attacked anybody okay because it's a public threat and we talk about european countries which are very advanced and environment friendly but they can't stand a single wolf they have probably less than a dozen wolves and each time a wolf shows up they go and shoot it down whereas in india even when a tiger or an elephant has come and killed four five people you know the we still don't go and shoot it down we actually forest department goes out tries to catch it gives it a second lease of life so i really think that we need to celebrate this wild my first film like with the forest department was wild karnataka so i'll show you the trailer and then i'm happy to take some questions 
do I ha do I have two more minutes? I don't run out of time. Okay. <laughs> so uh, one of thank you. Um, so again, uh, one of the joys of uh, spending so much time in the forest and following is you never know what what to expect. And and while filming Wild Karnataka, we uh, we came across this what is called as a lacking behavior of of our national bird, the peacock, which I haven't seen before. It hasn't been documented before. So it's, uh, it's a small uh, two minute thing which I'll show you, and then I can take questions. Yeah. Thank you.